entitled Weigh Your Decisions. Principle. Decisions made from carnal promptings will have devastating consequences on God's people. Turn to Genesis, the 13th chapter, verses 7 and 11. We're going to take a look at some examples of this. Making a wrong decision based on carnality and the ramifications thereof. Genesis 13, starting in verse 7. And there was a strife between the herdsmen of, Ab of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. The Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between my brethren and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, <clears throat> even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest to Zoar. And Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. When you read this, what you find is Lot decision number one was based off of greed. And number two, what he should have done being the younger was to offer the elder Abraham the choice. The choice is place, and then if Abraham refused, then he would have taken it. But he just determined that he wanted it all. And so he that set himself in motion. Now we find something very interesting because uh, the Lord is watching all this. Y H V H. Verse twelve. And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. So he came into the influence of sin. Uh, the cities were centers of Luciferian influence. And when he became into that, came into that region, came under that influence, he was drawn irrevocably into the middle of it. Now notice what it goes on to say. Men of Sodom were wicked sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot separated him from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward, and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it to thy seed forever. And I'll make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed be numbered. Arise, walk through the land, the length of it, and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent, and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, <coughs> which is Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. So what took place here is the Lord blessed Abraham. Because Abraham didn't have to humble himself the way he did. He told Lot, he gave Lot the choice. <clears throat> he was the senior. He was like Lot's father. And Lot just took advantage of it. So what happened, the Lord tells Abram, <clears throat> I'm going to give you all the land. Everything. Ultimately, Lot was going to lose everything. He made the wrong choice. Drop down to Genesis <clears throat> 19 verses 5 to 9. Genesis 19 verses 5 to 9. <clears throat> and 
and they called Lot, and they called unto Lot, <coughs> and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. So he's dealing with the Sodomites. And Lot went out at the door unto them, and shut the door after him, <coughs> and said, I pray thee, I pray thee, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters, which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye <coughs> do them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for they came <coughs> under, my, under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This <coughs> one fellow came to sojourn, <coughs> and he will be needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed <coughs> sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. So Lot, <coughs> even though he was rich, even though he had lived there a long time, was never accepted by these people. He was always considered a stranger. <coughs> and because he engendered their ire, the anger, ultimately, they were determined after they got through with the two men, they were going to kill him. Of course, <coughs> things happened around the other way. So Lot loses. He never gained the respect <coughs> of his neighbors. Drop down to verse 14. Now he spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up! Oh, Get ye out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. <coughs> but he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons in law. So we find ultimately that <coughs> because of that decision, his daughters, he had, evidently had four, the two older ones, his uh, daughters were inextricably, their destiny were tied inextricably with the sons. Uh, in law and um, refused to take advantage of the escape route that was open to them. Genesis 19 verse 26 His wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. So he lost his wife. <coughs> he lost his married daughters. Genesis 19, 31 to 32. This one said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come into us after the manner of all the earth. <clears throat> come, let us make our father drink wine, that we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed unto our father. So the ultimate indignity of it was that he engendered a race of individuals out of it incest. All this because of one decision that he made that triggered a series of decisions that led ultimately to him losing everything. <coughs> Turn to 1 Samuel 15 verses 1 to 9. <coughs> Samuel also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel. They laid in wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, <coughs> and spare them not. I slay both men and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. I so saw gathered the people together and numbered them in Tilam, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. 
So I came to the city of Amalek and lay wait in the valley. So I said unto the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, and start to destroy you with them. But you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. It's all smoke the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, <coughs> that is over against Egypt. They took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag in the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and of the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse they destroyed utterly. Now, <clears throat> we found that Lot's problem was greed. Saul's problem was compromise. <clears throat> Not doing what he knew he was supposed to do because of circumstance. Wanting to <clears throat> make excuse for preserving the best <clears throat> but knowing that he was called to destroy everything. Now notice what Samuel says to him. 1 Samuel 15 verses 16 to 23. <clears throat> Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. <clears throat> Samuel said, When I was little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. The Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners of the Amalekites and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Saul said unto Samuel, Yes, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took up the spoil, sheep, and oxen, and the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. So he rationalizes his compromise. Well, we didn't do what the Lord told us to do because we saw these goodly sheep and oxen and everything and how much of a good sacrifice it would make to the Lord. It's the same rationale that you have with people who say, I know I should do this, but the Lord knows my heart. I'm not doing this, I'm doing that, <clears throat> but, and then they come up with an excuse for why they did it. It's compromise. And it's worse than if the person would just be honest enough and say, I didn't do it because I didn't want to do it because I felt I wanted to do something else. Notice what Samuel says. <clears throat> Samuel said, Half the Lord is great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. To remain committed to what we know the Lord has called us to do is better than anything else. <clears throat> Saul could have brought 10,000 sheep, goats, and rams and said, this, we brought this to sacrifice to God. It would not have pre pleased YHVH. He wanted Saul's obedience. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Compromise is a form of rebellion. It's not doing what one knows one should do. <clears throat> it is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Saul made a decision. The decision cost him heavy. <clears throat> Drop down to 1 Samuel 16. Verses 13 to 14. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, David, 
in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. <coughs> Demon replaced the Holy Spirit. <coughs> the decision that he made had ramifications on down the line. When he made that decision, he put himself in a position where he would make other decisions based on this one decision, and it magnified, it strengthened the departure from the Lord, same as lying. That's one decision set up a series of other decisions that took him further and further and further into <coughs> an alien environment, alien conditions, things that were not meant for him to be in in the first place, activities that were not meant for him to indulge in, <coughs> and it continued on and on until it literally uh, reached the stage where he lost everything. Same thing with Saul. <clears throat> for Samuel 28, verse 6. <clears throat> Samuel's decision <clears throat> At the behest, it ultimately brought the demon into his life, which caused him to become a uh, demon influence for the remainder of his reign. <clears throat> and under his demonic influence, he became paranoid. And that's the way he responded. In 1 Samuel 28, verse 6, we find how far out he went. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urm, nor by prophets. So he's literally in a place where he's been isolated, totally separated, <coughs> totally out of contact. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek ye, seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that may go to her and inquire of her. The servant said unto him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit in Indoor. So he resorts to <coughs> consorting with a witch, consorting with the occult, because of one decision that he made based off of carnality. Turn, <coughs> well, ultimately he winds up losing everything. His sons he killed in a battle. They take their heads, string them up on the, the gates at the, the capital city of the Philistines, drag their bodies through the streets. Uh, a total uh, <coughs> disrespect, total taken down to the lowest level possible. Turn to 1 Kings, 12th chapter. I'm going to read about another person that made a decision based off of carnality. We're going to Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And Rehoboam went to Shechem for all for all Israel will come to Shechem to make him king. All Israel. So all the tribes came up to this place to anoint him <coughs> because Solomon's already died. It came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt. But they went and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came <coughs> and spake unto Rehoboam. So this guy was an, a fugitive. <coughs> Solomon wanted to kill him. So he fled into Egypt. When he hear Sol heard Solomon's dead, Rehoboam is now going to be king. He comes back. And they come before him to plead their case. <coughs> Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came 
and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore made thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me, and the people departed. The king Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived, and said, How do you advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and will serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. In other words, perpetually you have their loyalty. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, <coughs> which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye me, that we may answer this people? who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with them spake unto him, saying, Thus shall ye speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. <clears throat> Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now where is my father? did lay you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Arrogance. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old man's counsel that they gave him spake unto them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilamite unto Jeroboam the son of Nabat. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. So what you had was a, uh, <coughs> a uh, re rebellion where you had um, ten tribes. Uh, separate themselves from the tribe of Judah. Um, they seceded, in other words, from uh, under the authority of Rehoboam, and they went north. The whole ten. That was the majority of the nation. It was left. What was left to him was Judah and Levi, the priest tribe. He was going to go to war, but the prophet stopped him, saying, <coughs> "You wouldn't prevail against them because this is from the Lord." <coughs> His decision caused a tremendous uh, series of things to happen. The ten tribes went north, went into idolatry, ultimately several generations later went into captivity to the Assyrians. They never again were one nation. They never will be one nation until the second coming. Of course, they're going to be gathered here under YHVH, but they're going to go into captivity again. <clears throat> One decision made in arrogance had a ripple effect which caused generations of strife, vitriolic acrimony that goes to this, I mean, thousands of years to this day the separation still remains. Now, turn to Colossians, the third chapter, verses 5 to 14.
Colossians 3, <coughs> verses 5 to 14. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. So what he's saying here is those things that cause us to make decisions based off of a carnal motive, a carnal agenda, we are to put to death so that we can make a decision based off of spiritual clarity. <coughs> Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication and cleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things say the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. So basically what he's saying here is unsaved people make these same decisions. And they set in motion things <coughs> that line up to bring curses into their lives in ultimate judgment. A decision based off of a carnal rationale sets in motion a series of other decisions that take us further and further away from freedom, away from the presence of the Lord, away from the will of God, into an alien environment in which the enemy can afflict, abuse, and misuse us to the degree to which we cry out, repent, and the Lord makes it in such a way that we can turn back. Paul here is talking about <clears throat> being diligent to monitor our behavior. In the which ye also walked sometimes, or at one time when you lived in them. But now you also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, for Christ is all and in all. What he's saying here is the decisions that we make are determining the position that we are going to have in this life and in eternity. What we are doing today is the result of the decisions we have made in the past. The freedom we enjoy today is predicated off of the decisions we have made in the past. The decisions we made today determine what we're going to be doing a million years from today. <clears throat> That's why we need to put down the carnal nature and allow the spiritual clarity to come forth so that we can make the right decisions decisions because when we make a wrong decision it sets things in motion and instead of advancing we retrograde the more carnal we are the more <coughs> carnal we become it never stays on a level playing field it always advances and grows whether spiritual or carnal so the scripture here is telling us to we're making decisions every day to make the right decision, to make the wise decision, the objective decision. And if we have to make a snap decision, to be spiritually aware so that we get the leading of the Holy Spirit in making that decision. And we'll always have a free hand in <coughs> enabling ourselves to perceive the results of what we have done. In other words, never make a decision that you don't know what the consequences are going to be. Be sure that the consequences of the decision that you make merely by looking at a period of time in the future, what the decision is going to be like, <coughs> the future will give you the understanding. When we make a carnal decision, we look at it from a future perspective, it's never good. We make a spiritual decision, we look at a future perspective, it's always good. God guarantees it. <clears throat> Total eternal progression. Now we're going to be going through some principles that will seem repetitive, but it's done for a reason. That is that we must understand these principles in a deeper way so that we can 
enable a progression to become <coughs> more full, more complete. This is what the Holy Spirit laid on my heart when I was doing this lesson. First principle, Scripture teaches that the Father has created a race of divine cosmic beings who are developing in the midst of the human race. 1 John, 3rd chapter, verses 1 to 2. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. We have been created, cosmic divine beings, in the midst of the human race. The human race does not recognize what's going on in its midst. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, but we shall see him as he is. So we're beings <coughs> in transition. <coughs> Principle, this race is to be patterned after himself, God, the Father, with all his, all his attributes. Romans 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I want to focus on this word, image. Turn to Hebrews, the first chapter, verse 1 to 3. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past by the fathers, times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory, and the express image, the word expressed there is exact, image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sent down on the right hand of the majesty on high so what he's saying here he talks about the expressed image of his person he's talking about all the attributes of the father are in the son exact duplication exact replication all the attributes the Father are being formed in us. Exact duplication, exact replication, only on a slow, a much lower level because the Father is infinite. And we will be in infinity, capable of sustaining ourselves in eternity and infinity because we have the Father's image, His attributes, His characteristics, His abilities. This is what we're undergoing currently. <clears throat> we're in transition to a completed state. Principle, Scripture teaches a transformation is taking place from the human to the divine identity. Galatians, the third chapter, verse 27 to 28. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It's not talking about water baptism. It's talking of the baptism by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. Supernatural recreation. 
There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So what's being said is we're being transformed to this new image. We're being disengaged from the old image. A transition is taking place. <clears throat> and this transition is just as real, if not more real, than the aging process and the other things that take place on the outside. Scripture teaches the corrupt human faculties, the mind, the emotions, in the saint will automatically resist the transformation process because the corrupt human faculties sense the transformation to be a threat to its survival. In Romans 7th chapter verses 14 to 23. But we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin, <clears throat> in a state of corruption. For that which I do I allow not, for what I would I do not, for what I hate that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. The evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwelleth in me find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, the new creation, delights in the things of God. But I see another law in my members, my inner being, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. So that carnal is under the law of sin and death. The spiritual is under the law of <clears throat> the spirit of liberty, of life in Christ. And these two war against each other. A wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me out of this body, of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord, so then with a, with a mind I serve myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So what he's saying here is that the human nature, carnal nature, will automatically fight against this transformation. It's, it's automatic. You don't have to do anything to set it in motion. The enemy takes total advantage of that. And he'll put thoughts in your mind to, to enhance the resistance to the transformation. Romans 8. Verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So of its nature, it stands in opposition to God and the things of God. Of, of its very nature, it stands in opposition to the transition that's automatically taking place within. First Corinthians. Second chapter, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So what we have is the crux of the problem here. When we are given over to dwell in the senses, in this world 
system, you automatically, no matter how good, how righteous we are in Christ, we automatically put ourselves in subjectivity to the natural inclinations. And being that, when the enemy knows this and takes full advantage of it, and he will bring things into life to draw the focus more and more and more onto the natural order of things away from the transition that's taking place within. <clears throat> He'll set as much as he can to detract, to deflect, to nullify as much as he can the progression into the eternal completed states that the Father is desiring, us, desiring to take us. Which brings us to the next principle. <clears throat> Scripture teaches when the desires of the inner are perceived the most prominent will be its desire to ascend into the heavens. The enemy has pulled all stops out to keep the saint from understanding the desires of the spirit. He will totally have the focus on the desires. Like Paul here is wrestling. He's talking about wrestling with trying to bring forth what's already in him. He's dealing with an alien set of circumstances, yet that's him. The natural person <coughs> is fighting against the progression of the spiritual person. <coughs> and the natural person is being directed to incite the law of sin and death so that it can bring upon the life those things <coughs> that will cause bondage, that will cause curses, and that will ultimately bring it to judgment. When a person operates from the emotions, the mental state is keyed into the carnal emotions, then they automatically yield and they automatically detract from their path of the spiritual. They go into an altered direction and unless they correct that direction, they're going to continue <coughs> going away from where they should be. This is what he's talking about. The desires of the inner are so absolutely radically different than the desires of the outer. When a person begins to realize, begins to receive what's really taking place in his spirit, <clears throat> he'll feel like a Jekyll and Hyde because the experience is so radically different. I want to take a look at some scriptures. <clears throat> it says that the first desire, the most prominent desire will be to ascend. Now, how does that take place? Well, Paul speaks about the method that he uses. Turn to 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verse 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul is saying, <coughs> he disciplines his mind and his emotions and his carnal to be subjected, come under subjection, subjection to the Spirit. When that happens, emotions of the spirit, the desires of the spirit
when the carnal nature is disciplined to be subservient to the spiritual nature, then the feelings and desires of the new nature make themselves real to the saint. And the first desire <coughs> that the spirit will relate is its desire to ascend into the heaven. Second Corinthians, fifth chapter, verse two. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. It doesn't just say desire, this is earnestly desires. This is basically saying that this is the prime desire of the spirit. And when the mind is disciplined enough to receive that, then the whole thoughts, the whole emotional, the whole view takes a quantum shift from the, the carnal, what's going on on the outside, to what's going on on the inside, to satisfy, gratify the desires <coughs> of the spirit, of the new creation, of the real person. <coughs> Principle, Scripture teaches, it is the Father who has put this urge into the new creation mentality. <coughs> Drop down to verse 5, same chapter. Now he that hath wrought us for the same thing, or ordained us for the same thing, is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit, and the down payment of the Spirit. What he's saying is that God has put this prime desire in the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit is meant to dominate the life, and in dominating the life, the life is meant to gravitate toward its destiny, the things of heaven. Turn to Colossians, third chapter, verses 1 to 3. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. For Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. The only way that this can be done is if the desire is there. The only way that the desire can be there, it is there. The only way it can be felt is when the mind and the emotions are disciplined enough to become subservient to the spirit. Then the desire comes forth. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. The whole life takes a radical turn. <clears throat> Progression toward the destiny, which is the heavens. Now, the scripture tells us, scripture teaches, as the desire for the ascension becomes greater and greater, the Holy Spirit is transforming the new creation's ability to ascend to higher and higher levels of glory. 2 Corinthians, 3rd chapter, verse 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. This is basically saying that the Holy Spirit will convey to us the finished product. The glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. <coughs> Romans 8, 29, whom he did for know them he did predestinate to be conformed to the image. The Father poured everything into his predetermined plan for the destiny 
of this race. He put the spirit there so that it would have the desire to progress toward the heavens. He put experiences in the life that would enable the spirit, not the outer, but the inner, to reach a stage of maturity in levels of glory by overcoming each experience. And in doing that, and the being becomes formed more and more to the finished product the Father designed it to be. More and more able to mount up to greater and greater levels of glory. With each experience, maturity level increases until it's maximized. With each experience, with the mind discipline, emotions discipline, to the spirit, and the spirit dominating, understanding comes. And then the Holy Spirit will give revelation on a spiritual level. Turn to the Gospel of John, 16th chapter, <coughs> verses 13 to 15. Now be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and show it unto you. All things that the Father hath of mine, therefore said I, he shall take of mine, and show it unto you. He will take your spirit, and he will <coughs> open the panorama of understanding of the things of eternity. He will demonstrate, and there were times when he can take you right out of your body into eternity and show you things. There are other times when he'll bring revelation knowledge to your understanding. He'll give you an understanding of who you are what your progress is, what the finished product is, what the experience is that you are undergoing signify. It says he will show you, he will take you and he will reveal all truth to you. It depends upon us receiving the desires to progress. Now the problem with Christians is that they don't make the transition from carnal to spiritual. They don't reach a stage where the spirit's desires manifest into the consciousness. And the reason for that, of course, is because they're <clears throat> living in a world of Luciferian influence, living in a world of tear influence, living in a world where they do not make a determination to discipline their own emotions, their own mentality, so that this transformation process is automatically taking place, will be perceived and understood. 99.999 tenths of the Christians in this society never even reach a stage of understanding what is taking place in their life. Never reach a state of understanding of what the new birth experience means because they spend their lives focusing on this world. You have to get out from underneath the earth, the earth's influence. That's why God mandated the church to be a community where it would be insulated from the Luciferian influence because of divide and conquer, <clears throat> the church has even lost the significance of what it was designed to do, what it was designed to be. So most Christians will progress only as they determine in their own hearts that they want to receive revelation knowledge. We see examples of the enemy 
The enemy has one design, one desire, and that is to censor the saint, to neutralize his ability to perceive of himself from God's perspective. They ingrain and graft an image into the saint that he will see himself from a human, carnal mentality. And when he sees himself in that perspective, he goes into bondage, limitation. He's dealing with the world, the world's system, the world's priorities, <coughs> the world's programming. And, uh, of course, it's meant to become a convoluted set of circumstances. It never progresses, it just goes around in circles, never achieving anything. The bottom line is, God has designed this whole thing to act automatically. All we have to do is just yield to what's going on in us already. And when you begin to experience the desires of the Spirit, it'll take your breath away. And you begin to reach a stage where you know that you're progressing into the eternal. And you realize that you're going to reach a stage in which <coughs> the limitations and the confinements of earth are no longer prevalent. Then, the only thing that you deal with is how to prepare for the change, the transition from <coughs> this dynamic to true life, eternal life. <coughs>